Media Dialogues in 2022. Hello, welcome to Media Dialogues. I have a special guest on the show today. Shashi Shekhar Vempati was the CEO of Prasar Bharti, the government company that runs the vast terrestrial and satellite network of Doordarshan, as well as the All India Radio Network and their digital avatars. Mandated with providing information, education and entertainment, it's also the repository of all audiovisual archival material that belongs to the Indian state. Shashi is the first non-bureaucrat or the a person from the private sector to have been appointed in in this role in 2017 and his five-year tenure came to an end last month. He's here to give us his perspective on the dynamic media landscape we inhabit and of course the state broadcaster's place in it. Shashi, thank you very much thank for you. coming in for this conversation. Very happy to be here and uh, very excited uh, to have this conversation. What would you look back and say were the highlights of the five years that you led Prasar Bharti? You know, Prasar Bharti as you know, India's public broadcaster is one of the largest broadcasting organizations in the world. And as you rightly uh, said in your introductory uh, comments that uh, it runs a vast terrestrial yeah. network in addition to satellite. Uh, there is no private uh, terrestrial TV yes. network in India. So it's all uh, you know, the public uh, body that was doing it. Uh, so, so some of the key highlights I would say are the big change mm -hmm. that the broadcaster had to go through. Uh, in terms of uh, phasing out obsolete technologies, uh, figuring out the manpower roadmap uh, with you know how technology has changed, bringing in IT, uh, transitioning to digital, uh, and then growing some of the platforms like Freedish, News on Air app, uh, incubating new uh, ideas like the Prasar Bharti news service. So I would say these are some of the you know key uh, mm -hmm. highlights of, of these five years. You were quoted as saying that FY22, so last year, um, the commercial revenues were up 13%. So what are they at? And would you be able to give us a breakup of how that uh, has accrued? Right. So one of the, uh, the, the big changes that has happened over the last five years is how the revenue mix of Prasar Bharti has changed. Right. Historically, uh, government as a source of revenue, primarily for advertising yeah. and you know sponsored content, was a big, big chunk. What has changed uh, during these five years is how non-traditional sources of revenue mm -hmm. have reduced the dependence on government as a you know source of uh, revenue for uh, DD and AAR. A big component of that was Freedish. Mm -hmm. uh, Freedish used to be about 270 crores when I had joined as uh, the CEO, uh, and by the time uh, you know mm -hmm. last financial year and this year. Uh, the revenues have crossed 700 crores, touched almost 750 crores, Friedish alone. Yeah. So that's a big, uh, big cushion for, for the public broadcaster. Uh, digital is growing very fast. Uh, there was hardly any digital revenue when I had joined. And uh, now it is you know, several crores, growing at almost 30, 40 percent mm -hmm. a year. Uh, then we have also have assets. Yeah. We have several TV towers, yes. which are rented out to uh, both the private FM operators mm -hmm. and telecom operators. And that generates another 100 crores. Uh, so, so, so this revenue growth uh, that you're seeing mm. is largely contributed by these non-traditional uh, sources of revenue. Uh, interestingly, also our radio revenue saw uh, recovery from COVID. So a little bit of that also contributed to the overall growth. Uh, but it's primarily mm. you know, non-traditional revenues, Friedish, digital, uh, asset monetization. All of these you know, contributed to that uh, revenue growth. So let's talk a little bit about Freedish because uh, it, uh, I think the private broadcasters have an interesting relationship with Freedish. Over the years, ever <laughs> since it was launched, it's a, it's a tricky relationship. Let's say it's a, there's some love, there's some hate, and there is also a lot of desire for the audience. I think, what, 43 million homes? 43 is the uh, estimate that I've seen from ENY. My personal readers, that estimate is on the lower side. I think it's much higher. What would your number be? Uh, probably close to five, uh, you know, five crores, fifty million. And that is the largest DTH service Platform. provider in that sense, yes. right? We know broadcasters, especially the large ones, have a. They're not running their flagship channels on the on free dish as of this point, and this is this is something that goes on and off over the years, right? right, right. Uh, small broadcasters, I think, are finding the auction process a little difficult because they're finding the money's going high. Give me a sense of your perspective of how this relationship has panned out. So Fredish was, uh, in fact, I must compliment the, the foresight of uh, the then NDA government under uh, late Atal Bihari Vajpayee, mm. that they envisioned a platform of this mm. nature. Uh, so this was given cabinet approval sometime in 2002, 2003 timeframe. And at that time, uh, hmm. the stipulation was that 
the platform has to be uh, financially self-sustaining. It should not create a recurring liability. So it was important to bring private uh, partners onto the platform so that uh, you know the platform yes. pays for itself. Uh, initially, the placement of private channels was through a committee process. Then in around 2010, there was a need that was felt that uh, you know the process has to be transparent. Uh, and, and this was also following a TDSAT ruling at that point in time, mm -hmm. and auctions were brought in. Uh, and so private channels have to bid for these slots. And over the years, the policy has evolved, starting from you know one common base price to everyone, mm -hmm. to now what is a differentiated uh, base price based on the genre, Genres. the language, yeah. right? So where there's potential for you know value creation. And what that has resulted in is this immense value creation for Prasar Bharti because it has unlocked the potential of the platform. Of course, as you rightly described it, it's a love and uh, hate relationship. Uh, however, I think uh, being the largest platform out there with this immense base, which is only growing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, especially during the lockdown and COVID, we've <clears throat> seen that uh, the the educational channels that are also available on this were a huge draw and and. Uh, in fact, the dealers uh, who sell these set-top boxes mm -hmm. reported to us that, you know, the demand has only been mm -hmm. growing and it's just impossible for them to keep up with the demand uh, for these set-top boxes because it is free, there's no monthly fee. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the private channels get access to an immense reach, especially in the Hindi heartland. And now as we add more languages, uh, you know, it's growing beyond the Hindi heartland as well. Uh, and, and with the promised 200 educational channels, mm -hmm. Uh, I see that you know it has a lot of uh, uh, headroom for growth. What I see, Friedish, uh, you know, to draw the analogy of YouTube for as an example, it's a platform for competitiveness. It has empowered smaller channels uh, to challenge the incumbents, right? Especially if you see in the Hindi GEC, genre, yeah. GEC segment. I think Dungal channels. was a was a <laughs> discovery thanks to uh, Friedish, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely that. Mm. And even now, when I look at the uh, GEC ratings. Mm. Uh, there are several Friedish channels which are in the top 10 uh, in terms of viewership. Uh, so it has enabled competition, and I think that is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, you know, the public purpose is to enable more choice to the consumers, create a competitive environment, and that's what we did. But I guess for private broadcasters, then it is about maneuvering their strategic interests at any given point of time, because it is a trade-off between reach and advertising revenues that would come from that and subscription revenues, which everybody is very keen to try and grow, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is uh, the question before uh, all pub private mm. broadcasters, that, mm. you know, how do you find that balance? Right. How do you find that? Uh, but it's also interesting that, you know, it's not just entertainment channels. There's a whole lot of... Uh, news channels. Often, you know, the question that uh, uh, that would be put to the public broadcaster mm -hmm. is, you know, Doordarshan is the government's mouthpiece. I tell them, no, it is not uh, the government's mouthpiece. Look at Friedish. I don't just carry DD News. I carry 20 other mm -hmm. uh, Hindi news channels or 25 other uh, news channels. So look at the plurality of opinion, right? And this is available for free in every uh, household. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it has created, uh, you know, diversity of content. Now you have food channel, uh, you know, uh, with a celebrated chef. Uh, and in fact, he dedicated even a dish recently <laughs> to D.D. Fridish, so it was very <laughs> kind of him, uh, huh. with Mr. Sanjeev Kapoor. So, yeah. uh, so it's it's interesting that uh, the platform is not just uh, you know uh, the tier two entertainment. It is not just news. Now it has a full diversity of yeah. content, and with educational content, I think it's reaching a very broad spectrum of the society. What do you make of the four leading broadcasters not putting the flagship channel on right now? <laughs> So uh, we've we've been through this before, uh, even in 2019. Yeah. You know when uh, we had come up with the new policy. Mm. Uh, I see that as a you know consequence of uh, the the NTO regime, right? Mm. One of the yeah. unintended yes. consequences was this yeah. impact on uh, Friedish. But I see that as a you know a temporary transient mm. uh, phenomena. Mm. And uh, even now the the big players have other channels. It's not that you know they completely exited the platform yeah, because they see course. value in it mm. and. For the first time, your network has put a sports channel. Yes. Uh, so I think uh, News 18 Kilo. Kilo, right? <laughs> so uh, so, uh, so I don't uh, I don't see that as you know as something very big, mm. uh, but it, it's a reflection of the change that the media sector has had to go through mm. uh, due to the NTO regime, and I think at some point you know, uh, will we'll come out of it and, and I'm hopeful that, you know, they will also come back. So you mentioned the NTO regime. We know that the NTO is very highly contentious and it's in courts. Um, there, there is a feeling among private broadcasters that the TRAI, which is the telecom uh, regulator, which is also the broadcast sector regulator, perhaps 
may not be the ideal regulator for this sector. What's your view on that? Because you have a pretty cross-sectional understanding of the sector, isn't yeah. it? Absolutely. I think uh, technology has mm. changed, right? The how we are consuming media has changed. Uh, television, traditional television and traditional uh, radio will not be the primary yeah. modes of consuming media. Uh, increasingly more and more consumption is happening on smartphones, mobile phones, through digital apps and so on. Uh, so clearly the moment calls for a regulatory framework. Do we need a regulator just for the broadcast industry? No, I think it has to be broader than that. Mm. I think it should be a media uh, regulatory framework. Uh, because uh, and regulator of course it has to have a regulatory function because mm. uh, there are certain aspects which have to be regulated right uh, not so much pricing I personally don't feel that pricing mm. is something that you know I've not seen it anywhere in the world right that content is yeah you know, exactly content pricing is regulated in fact the the role has to be to allow more innovation more flexibility let interesting mm. pricing models evolve why should you know regulator get into that However, on the content side, mm. uh, especially with what uh, the IT rules and you know the digital yeah. framework that has been yeah. put in place, very important. Uh, we have seen now what's happening across the world uh, with the way in which outside uh, entities, external entities have influenced elections, uh, how fake news is spread, uh, especially during COVID. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges for us was making sure that the right information is out there. Mm. Uh, so, so there is a need for uh, regulation. There is no doubt about it. And, and that requires a, a media regulatory framework which uses technology in a big way because algorithms are going to be very, very important right mm -hmm. now. With all the big platforms, there is mm -hmm. very opaque uh, you know, algorithms. You have no idea what content is being prioritized, what content is being dished out. Uh, we saw with TikTok recently yep. how you know, data is being accessed in China. Uh, so, so you need a very progressive, uh, future-minded mm. regulatory framework which takes advantage of technology. It's also looking ahead in terms of you know where things will be, uh, and uh, the Indian consumer is very savvy with technology. In fact, most of the time we're playing catch up, yeah. both as the broadcaster or as the regulator or as the government. Mm. Uh, so, we, so this framework has to you know go ahead. You know, you talked about how you know algorithm-based tech companies um, have a large say in what media we are consuming, what news is going out there. We're talking at a time where Twitter has just taken the government of India to court. Uh, what is your take on that? Uh, because you know, not all law is necessarily good, but in right. this particular case, um, do, what what do you make of it? So, one of the the, uh, the outcomes of you know this whole digital era mm. with the internet is that you know borders have become irrelevant yes. in certain way as far as flow of information is concerned and the flow of ideas is concerned. It has fostered innovation. It mm. has brought in a lot of new technology. Mm. However, at the same time, I think the sovereignty of a nation is very very important. Uh, we've seen how uh, during the Ukraine-Russia conflict, uh, how a platform can just turn off, you know, a certain yeah. point of view, right? And no sovereign nation can allow that kind of power uh, to a platform. Then platforms' actions have to be transparent. We've seen time and again when my Twitter account was, you know, disabled for a short period. So it's a very opaque process. Mm -hmm. You have no idea who's doing what, right? Uh, so, so platforms have to be held to account. Uh, and and so so there has to be a regulatory framework to look at you know uh, how these algorithms operate, uh, what kind of decisions the platforms are making, and they have to respect the laws of the land, uh, without a doubt. But they do have the right to question the laws of, of course, the land of course, in the courts. Of course, I mean that mm. that I think that recourse mm. will always be there in sure. a democracy and in a republic like ours, which has uh, you know based on a constitution and uh, based on laws. Uh, however, uh, I think uh, a large country, a sovereign country, democracy like India, uh, also has to have a way of reaching citizens where you're not held hostage by any platform. Mm. To give you an example, during COVID, right, uh, it was very important for the prime minister to get out there and you know uh, address the citizens. Uh, put which out, he did. Uh, which he did mm. several occasions. Mm. Now, when I look at the numbers, the TV audience numbers, uh, you were barely getting to about 200 million uh, you know, viewers on an average, mm. uh, while uh, you know, in a nation of a billion, that's that's just a fraction. So there are limits to how much the TV universe can get mm. you, and if you, and digital can't, you know, uh, take you beyond that. And digital, you're at the mercy of various platforms, whether you know, mm. uh, the YouTube algorithm mm. puts uh, this live stream on the top, or whether Facebook Live, uh, you know, helps you discover it and so on. Uh, so so there has to be a third way in which uh, uh, you know the government should be able to reach all citizens and what would that and, be and that's where i see the potential for a new technology mm. uh, especially with 5g and you know these mm. networks coming in 
the direct to mobile broadcasting you're looking at uh, you know a mobile base yeah. which is almost 600 700 million, million yeah. right five times the tv base uh, so so that is a very critical very strategic kind of capability and and that's something i'm sure india will look at very closely some good work has already happened uh, with iit kanpur and uh, mm. a bunch of indian startups uh, in developing this capability uh, also globally people are looking at this uh, europe for example has created a, a working group mm. for 5g broadcast mm. uh, the recent eurovision contest which yeah. was in the news because yes. of ukraine yes uh, was uh, i think broadcast on a 5g network for the mm. first time uh, so so they are also looking at this technology and this capability and it's an opportunity for us to take a leadership position we are the largest uh, mobile market we are an open market uh, you know largest democracy and the technology for this is all available yes it's available it's uh, it's being baked right now mm. uh, we have the opportunity to set the standards i think one of the things that i have observed is that despite being the largest market for mobile phones or mobile uh, communication or even media mm. uh, very little of this is uh, standardized by india and just look at the amount of emphasis china has mm. put on creating standards Right. For the first time with 5G I, uh, you have an Indian effort at creating a standard. Uh, with direct to mobile, we have the opportunity to take a leadership position. We are not just playing catch up in defining right. standards. Uh, you mentioned COVID several times to illustrate, uh, you know, some of the decisions and actions in the past uh, couple of years at Prasar Bharti. Uh, one of the things we all saw as viewers was the relaunch of Ramayan, right, in the first week. Ten, two weeks after the lockdown was announced, uh, to great spectacular ratings, new generations discovering this, uh, the you know the the story and Doordarshan's vast library. Um, give me a sense of what triggered that decision and the, <coughs> you know how Prasar Bharti has been able to leverage or monetize the nostalgia library archival material that is owned by Prasar Bharti. Uh, great question. Uh, I think I can share for the first time that. Uh, when the lockdown was mm. announced mm. and uh, you know we were debating you know what to do about it so i'll have to compliment both the prime minister and then the mm -hmm. then inb minister prakash javdekar yeah. that it was their uh, instance that you know we should air these epics and and uh, they were very clear that it had to be ramayan first because uh, the appeal of ramayan uh, to a very broad section of the country was going to be likely to be very high uh, so how do we get ramayan and uh, uh, the oddity that uh, with, with Doordarshan was some of its spectacular shows were actually not Doordarshan's property. Yeah. At that time, they were sponsored programs. So then we reached out to the Sagar family. I'm very thankful that you know they also rose up to the occasion uh, because Mumbai was in lockdown. This content was sitting somewhere in their archive library. Uh, people had to be sent. Special permissions had to be taken. The tapes were retrieved. The formats had changed. So our guys had to figure out how to get this format <laughs> into the format that we want. Uh, and we mounted a you know a satellite van to uh, read from Mumbai yeah. and and how interesting you know in in, in my framing <laughs> of this question I completely forgot that Ramayan was actually private the serial <laughs> TV serial Ramayan that yeah. aired in the 80s on Doordarshan was actually private property Ramanan Sagar's correct and not Doordarshan's not property Doordarshan's, but but I mean the, the strong brand association yeah. was such and uh, the. What I feel is that this is the first time hmm. India has watched Ramayan, not not the last time, because last time it was a terrestrial, it was limited to a very hmm. limited part of the country. Uh, but all of India truly watched Ramayan for the first time uh, during the lockdown, and which is why the spectacular numbers. And you, you made saw. good ad revenues. Good ad revenues for the first time. Doordarshan's rates were in the <laughs> lakh plus range, and uh, and uh, when I looked at the global uh, viewership numbers, I think Mash. Their finale had yeah. high, higher numbers than Ramayan, but otherwise Ramayan beat the charts. Uh, Shashi, uh, let's talk about TV news ratings because you were appointed by the government to look at this in a special committee when allegations came out about a scam and TRP rigging in this genre in 2020. Do you think the current system has addressed all the questions that were raised at that time? Interesting question. Uh, the, the TV ratings framework, because we were also... A, a, mm. a client of Bark, we yes. are also a consumer of rating, so uh, it was an interesting challenge for all of us. Uh, and always there is this lingering question, you know, is the ratings rigged? Are, are, are they, they robust? Are they are credible they robust, today? You know, uh, so I think the important thing to remember mm. uh, with the, the whole ratings uh, uh, methodology, it is sample based. So mm. at best it is an estimate, it is not objective sure. reality, right? Uh, and when you try to, you know, um, infer objective reality from these estimates, that is where we get into trouble. Mm. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, so as long as you remember that, then you, you know, your perspective is, uh, is clear. And now, of course, there are new methods, for example, return path data. The committee looked at, you know, what are the best practices and what are the challenges in the, uh, in the environment? And, and based on that, uh, the committee made several recommendations. Some recommendations were around corporate governance, how the ratings mm. agencies should mm. be governed. Mm. Some recommendations were around technology, what new technology process, process operational has to be processes. Put. Uh, but ultimately, in fact, one of the observations that I made uh, was that this is about business practices, right? And in a competitive environment, unless uh, all players mm -hmm. respect certain rules, certain business practices, and there's a broad consensus within that, uh, you'll always, you know, uh, question the ratings framework. And the rating can't solve that. It's a question of business culture mm -hmm. and competition. And that's something I think uh, all the stakeholders have to come together and respect. Uh, because you can put whatever algorithm, you can put whatever technology. Mm -hmm. But if all the stakeholders don't align, that you know these are the rules of the business, and we all respect that, and this is how we all abide by and you know play by. The new news rating system that was announced in March or that has mm. been in operation since March, do you think that has addressed some of the issues that were brought to light in 2020? See, there were two, three things that went into mm. this methodology, right? One of the uh, issue was that news as a genre. Mm is very erratic in its viewing patterns. Mm. Because news breaks, a lot of people watch Ukraine war happens, a lot of people watch, uh, right, tune in and tune out. Uh, so, so there was a need that was felt that, you know, we need to smoothen things mm. out, which is why we moved to the rolling average. Yeah. So to that extent, the yeah. four week rolling average, I think has addressed that. Mm. However, there are certain business practices like landing pages, for example, that is beyond the ability of the algorithm to solve because it's a business issue. And I think that's something the industry has to come to a consensus around and address it. I don't think the algorithms will ever solve that. Mm. Because there'll always be a question, you know, how long should you uh, ignore the rating? Is it 30 seconds? Is it 60 seconds? Is it one minute? Right. What uh, would your advice be? So my advice would be that uh, the, uh, the industry should either come to a consensus how this is measured. That is one way of looking at it. Or drop landing pages. Or drop, or, or there has to be a regulatory intervention. Mm. Uh, for example, uh, you could have a regulatory stipulation that says that uh, only platform services should be landing pages. Mm. So then that automatically solves the problem, mm. right? Uh, you could still advertise your channel on a platform service like Tata Sky does, yeah. right? Uh, at the same time, it's not a you know back measured. So there are different ways, ways in which this can solve be solved. This problem. So either you try to solve it algorithmically, but then you all have to agree that you know this algorithm. These are the rules of the rules game. Of it. Or there has to be a regulatory intervention. I'm going to close this show on a personal note, Shashi, and uh, that is the five years that you've spent as CEO of Prasar Bharti, you were what is today would be called a lateral entry, right, which right. the government has introduced uh, to get private sector talent and experience into, um, uh, into government. Um, what was the, the, these five years like? What would you say was the biggest challenge for you personally, given this route to this? Um... I, I think it's a great learning experience. I was a complete outsider to Delhi, especially Lutians Delhi, as, <laughs> as people like to refer to it. Uh, very thankful to the Prime Minister uh, for the opportunity. Uh, very thankful to then Chairman Prasad yes. Bharti, Dr. Suya Prakash, who was a big believer in you know bringing yeah. in professionals from the media sector, uh, and and people like uh, Mr. Nupendra Mishra, Dr. P. K. Mishra, who were very helpful in you know how do you navigate the government? Because if you are an outsider, it's very difficult to understand the bureaucraties, uh, the the spaghetti of you know rules, and uh, it's almost like you know there are landmines all around. You. <laughs> how do you avoid the landmines, and how do you get where you need to go? Uh, so, so all of them were very helpful in mentoring and guiding. And, and to me, the biggest uh, learning is how difficult it is uh, to do anything in the public space in India. I mean, just this microcosm that we, the small reforms that we tried to do, uh, gave me a sense of you know, the complexity, the challenges. Uh, you give a better appreciate the, the, the job that the prime minister has because I mean, he has to deal with such enormity of reforms across sectors. Uh, so, so reform is hard. It requires a lot of patience. Uh, you can't uh, just bulldoze your way through it. Uh, you need to take people into confidence. Uh, you need to convince them, uh, persuade them, understand their issues because invariably every reform mm. impacts someone or the other. No, and your tenure was also, you, and you were in the middle of a couple of controversies, maybe more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Friedrich, you know, changing mm. the policy was one such mm. example. Phasing out analog terrestrial TV, which is, I think, the biggest reform undertaken by Durdarshan, mm. has happened during these five years. Thousands of t obsolete TV transmitters were phased out. Uh, and uh, so each of these required persistence, a uh, lot of support. Uh, very thankful to the ministers, the, the ministry who you know, stood mm. by it despite you know, so much of 
uh, complaint, so much of pressure that, you know, why are these TV towers being phased out and so on. But we went through that process. Now, what that has helped us, it freed up resources. Mm. We could do, you know, more digital, more freakish, investing for the future, you know. We created a whole new app, a whole new digital news service. Uh, so all of these happened because of these things. Uh, so, so great learning experience. And I think uh, the, the, the public sector also benefits mm. by having outside talent professionals come in uh, and, and bring in that outside right. perspective. You may have a book in there uh, at some point, <laughs> uh, and we will look out to see what you do next. Thank you very much for talking to us on CNBC TV 18. Thank we you. wish you a lot of good luck. Thank you. And thank you very much for watching. Look out for another conversation on Media Dialogues next week. Media Dialogues in 2022.